In our discussion of the quicksort algorithm, we took the key function, the partition function, as a black box. Given a pivot element, the role of the partition function is to rearrange the vector so that the pivot element is in its proper position in the sorted order. And all elements to the left of the pivot element are at most the pivot element, and all elements to the right are greater than or equal to the pivot element. And we want to do this operation in time proportional to the size of the vector. So now let's open up this black box and see how we can actually implement the partition function. So quicksort is one of the most commonly used sorting algorithms, and a good partition function is critical to the performance of quicksort. So there's been a lot of theoretical and empirical study of partition algorithms, and several different partition algorithms have been proposed. So Hoare, the original inventor of quicksort back in 1961, proposed a partition function based on maintaining two indices. So one starting at the beginning of the vector, one starting at the end of the vector. And uh, as the algorithm went along, these uh, indices uh, approached each other. Okay. So this algorithm has good performance, but it can be slightly subtle to implement. So to make the presentation here easier, we are going to use a simpler algorithm due to Lomutu. Uh, so John Bentley wrote several papers about the performance of quicksort and also worked on a, uh, a C library implementation of, of quicksort. And in one of his Programming Pearls columns, he says the following. Most discussions of quicksort use a partitioning scheme based on two approaching indices, like the one described in problem three. So that's like the Hoare approach. Although the basic idea of that scheme is straightforward, I've always found it. Uh, I've always found the details tricky. I once spent the better part of two days chasing down a bug hiding in a short partitioning loop. A reader of a preliminary draft complained that the standard two-index method is in fact simpler than Lumutos, and sketched some code to make his point. I stopped looking after I found two bugs. So, uh, so this personal experience here kind of speaks to the subtleness of the whore type partition algorithm. Okay, so we're going to look at the Lumuto uh, partition algorithm instead. Okay, so here's the setup of the algorithm. We want to partition the half-closed interval defined by begin and end. And we're going to have two iterator variables in the function called left end and j. So j is going to be a loop variable. It starts at begin plus 1, and it's going to run over the elements of the vector until it gets to end. And left end is going to uh, start also start at begin plus 1. Okay, so at the beginning of the algorithm, we have this picture. Both left end and j are initialized at begin plus 1. And throughout the algorithm, we're going to maintain the property that begin is going to be less than left end, which is at most j. Okay, so in general, these three iterators, begin, left end, and j, they're going to partition the vector into three parts. Okay. So these three parts, they're very important to the algorithm, and they define the invariant that the algorithm is going to maintain. Okay, so the first part uh, are those positions from begin up to but not including left end. Okay, so that is the half-closed interval from begin to left end. And throughout the algorithm, we're going to maintain that all elements in this half-closed interval are at most the pivot. Now, the next uh, piece that we're going to look at are the elements from left end up to but not including j. And the algorithm is going to maintain that all the elements in this half-closed interval are greater than the pivot. Okay, and finally, what's left are the elements from j up to but not including end. And there's no uh, promise on these algorithms, uh, on these elements. So these are just the elements that are still waiting to be processed. So as usual, we want to show three things about an invariant. We want to show uh, 
that the invariant is true at the start of the algorithm, so this initialization condition. Then we want to show maintenance, that updates of the variables maintain the invariant. And then we want to look at termination, so that, it, that the invariant holding at the end of the algorithm uh, means that the algorithm achieves the goal that we wanted. Okay, so let's start out with initialization. So at the start, the half-close interval from begin to left end just includes begin. Okay, and uh, you know, begin points to the pivot, so of course uh, it's at most the pivot, um, so we're good for that interval. Uh, as left end is equal to j, the half-closed interval from left end to j is empty. Okay, so this condition that the elements in that half-closed interval are greater than the pivot, that's vacuously satisfied. So we're good there as well. And then the elements from j to end, uh, there's no condition on those elements, so we're fine there as well. Okay, so now we've shown that the invariant holds at the start of the algorithm. Okay, so here's the code for the loop in the Lumuto algorithm. Uh, you, and you can see this code working at the Godbolt link given in the top right corner of the slide. So first, we're going to work through the code uh, on this example, so you get a feeling for what this loop does. Uh, but as we go through the example, I want you to think about why the loop maintains the invariant. Okay, so, you know, the maintenance condition uh, showing that the invariant holds with the updates in the body of the for loop, that's usually the, the toughest thing to check about an invariant. Okay, so let's start at the first iteration of the loop. Okay, so we compare the element pointed to by j which is 3, because again, j starts at begin plus 1, and the element pointed to by begin, which is 5. Okay, so the if condition is true here, so we swap the elements pointed to by left end and j. But this actually does nothing, since they are the same element. Okay, and then we increment left end. Okay, so at the start of the second iteration, the picture looks as follows. So we've incremented left end and j. Okay, so since we left incremented left end, the red area has increased, right? The area in the interval from uh, begin to left end. So now in that red area, we have the elements five and three, and these elements are both at most the pivot. Okay, so we have preserved the invariant. So now let's do the body of the for loop on the second iteration. So again, the element pointed to by j, which is 2, is at most the pivot element 5. Uh, so again, the if condition is true, and we do a swap, which again does nothing, since left end and j point to the same element, and we increment left end again. Okay, so at the start of the third iteration, we, the picture looks as follows. We've incremented left end and j and we see that the invariant is still holding, right? All the elements in the red region are at most the pivot. Okay, so let's execute the body of the for loop again, now the third iteration of the for loop. So now something different happens. So now the element pointed to by j, which is 7, is actually greater than the pivot. Okay, so the if condition is false. So now we don't swap and we don't increment left end. Okay, so here's the picture at the start of the iteration 4, right? So we incremented j, and we did not increment left end in the last iteration. So now we actually have an element which is in the region from uh, left end to j, okay, the green region in this picture. And we see that the element in the green region is greater than the pivot. Okay, so our invariant is still holding. Okay, so now let's um, execute the body of the for loop in this fourth iteration. Uh, so like last time, we have that the element pointed to by j, which is 6, is bigger than the pivot. Okay, so the if condition is false, and we don't do a swap, we don't increment left end. Okay, so at the beginning of the next iteration, so now j has been incremented again, but we didn't increment left end, 
So this green region has grown, but we still have the property that all the elements in the green region are uh, greater than the pivot. Okay, so now let's do the body of the for loop again. Um, so now the element pointed to by j is three, and that's less than the pivot. So we are going to do a swap. Um, we're going to swap left end and uh, the element pointed to by left end with the element pointed to by j. So we're going to swap the three and the seven. Okay, so I've done that now. And so now let's see what happened. So there's an important point here. So after the swap, the element pointed to by left end is now at most the pivot, right? And we know that because the if condition was true. So also after the swap, the element pointed to by j must is greater than the pivot, right? Now j points to 7. And we know that's going to hold because before the swap, this element, this 7, it was pointed to by left end. So therefore, it was in the green region. And because the invariant held in the last step, we know that that element must have been greater than the pivot. OK? So now we can safely increment left end and j and maintain the invariant. OK? So, um, so that's what I'm going to do here. So I just incremented left end and j. And now we see that the, you know, the red region has grown. Now it includes that the red 3. And everything in the red region is still at most the pivot. Everything in the green region is, is bigger than the pivot. OK, so now we execute the body of the for loop in the sixth iteration. Uh, so now j points to 1, which is less than the pivot. So again, the if condition is true. We're going to swap um, 1 and 6, so the element pointed to by left end with the element pointed to by j. And we're going to increment left end. OK, so I've done that here. I've swapped the 1 and the 6, and I incremented left end. Um, so you see that the invariant still holds, right? Everything in the red region is at most the pivot. Everything in the green region is greater than the pivot. OK, getting to the end here. So in the seventh iteration, the element pointed to by j is bigger than the pivot. So the if condition is false. So we don't do a swap, and we don't increment left end. Um, so the start of the next iteration, we just increment j. But now j is equal to end. So the for loop terminates. OK, so now we've worked through that example, but we still need to check two things. So why, in general, the body of the for loop maintains the invariant and the termination condition. So what the invariant holding at the end of the for loop means for us. OK, so let's go ahead and do uh, maintenance first. OK. OK, so say we're at the start of a general iteration of the for loop and the invariant holds. So we have something like the picture given here. We know that everything in the red zone is at most the pivot, and everything in the green zone is greater than the pivot. OK, so now there are two cases. The first case is that the element pointed to by j is greater than the pivot. Uh, so then the if condition is false. So we don't do a swap, and we don't increment left end. OK, so at the start of the next iteration, all we will have done is just incremented j. OK, so that means that this green zone gets bigger. So now, um, but because the element that we just considered was greater than the pivot, it's fine for it to be in the green zone, right? The green zone is for the elements bigger than the pivot. So the invariant still holds. OK, so now let's look at the second case. So the second case is where the element pointed to by j is at most the pivot. So in the second case, the if condition uh, is true. And so we're going to swap the element pointed to by j with the element pointed to by left end. And since we assumed that the invariant held at the start of this iteration, we know that the element pointed to by left end is greater than the pivot. OK, so I'm going to swap this element, which is greater than the pivot, pointed to by left end, with the element which is at most the pivot, pointed to by j. OK, so I've gone ahead and done that now. I've just done the swap. 
right? So now we know, after the swap, that the element pointed to by left end is at most the pivot, and the element pointed to by j is greater than the pivot. Okay, so now since the element pointed to by left end is at most the pivot, it should be in the red zone, right? So how can we put it in the red zone? Well, we can just increment left end, okay? And of course, the element pointing to by j now, it's fine for it to be in the green zone because it's greater than the pivot. So it's fine to increment j as well. Okay, so after we increment left end and j, then we have a picture which looks like this. And you see that the invariant still holds, right? Because this new element in the red zone is at most the pivot, the new element in the green zone is greater than the pivot. Okay, so in both cases, the body of the for loop maintains the invariant. Okay, so now we've established that the invariant holds at the uh, beginning of the for loop, and we've shown maintenance that the body of the for loop maintains the invariant. So those two together mean that the invariant is still going to hold at the end of the for loop. So at the end of the for loop, j is equal to end. So this means that we have partitioned the entire interval. So all the elements from begin up to but not including left end are at most the pivot, and all the elements from left end up to but not including j, which is equal to end, are greater than the pivot. Okay, so that's exactly what we wanted to do. Um, and there's just one more thing that we need to do, and that's put the pivot in its proper place. Okay, so we want to put the pivot in its correct position in the final sorted vector. So where should the pivot go? Well, let's swap the pivot with the element at position left end minus 1. Okay, so now I've done that swap, and now everything to the left of the pivot is less than or equal to it, right, because everything is in the red zone, and everything to the right is in the green zone, so everything to the right is greater than the pivot. So this is a valid position for the pivot in the final sorted vector. Okay, and then the last step of the algorithm, the last thing that we have to do, is just to return the position of the pivot. So we just return left end minus one. Okay, so that's the entire uh, Lumuto partition algorithm. So let's look at the running time of this algorithm. So in the body of the for loop, we do a comparison to check the if condition, and we potentially do a swap and an increment. Okay, so this is all just a constant amount of work. So the running time of the whole for loop is proportional to the number of iterations, which is end minus begin. Okay, and apart from the for loop, there's just a constant amount of additional work. Um, you know, initializing left end and the swap and return statement after the for loop. So the total running time of the partition algorithm is theta of end minus begin. And this is what we used in the last video, right? So this is what we need uh, to argue that quicksort has worst case time complexity theta of n squared and average case time complexity theta of n log n.